Minigames are meant to offer you fun little breaks from the business at hand, like when I stop presenting a video and instead try to catch candy in my mouth. Oh, so close. Sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, minigames. But although these are usually just fun diversions, sometimes a minigame proves so fun that it gets turned into its own full game. Take Geometry Wars, for instance, which started life in Project Gotham Racing 2, or Gwent, which was previously just a way to spend time in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. That got us thinking about the minigames we loved so much we wish they'd be given the same treatment. And here they are. <sighs> oh, come on now. Don't be like that. It's gonna be fun. Just you wait. Resident Evil 7 introduced a number of innovative elements to the long-running survival horror series, including a first-person perspective, an intriguing demo, and the constant, overwhelming desire to stop playing and go and clean your kitchen. Ugh. What it also included were a couple of sequences which were less like your traditional Resident Evil and more like the complicated, escape-the-room, real-life puzzles you'd pay a fortune for if they were in an East London warehouse. The first was the Happy Birthday VHS tape. Playing this tape puts you in the shoes of cameraman Clancy Javis, who has evidently been captured by Lucas Baker and tasked with solving puzzles to escape a locked room full of traps. Take a candle, light it, and put it on the cake. What follows is a short but tightly designed sequence of searching, object puzzles, and clown horror as you try and win your freedom. Seriously, 25 quid per person in Hackney. Along the same lines was Resident Evil 7's Bedroom DLC. In this atmospheric, standalone experience, you play as, oh man, Clancy Javis again. That guy's having the worst day. Wow, uh, this, this looks delicious. Really, it, it looks great. In this DLC, Clancy wakes up shackled to a bed in one of the Baker family's many charming guest rooms, and you must figure out how to escape the room with the added pressure that Baker family matriarch Marguerite will periodically come in and vomit centipedes on you if anything is out of place. <laughs> I'm going to roast this place on TripAdvisor when I get home. Although these sequences were a welcome change of pace from the regular Resident Evil 7 experience, I for one would be happy to play a whole game of horror-themed escape the room puzzles in that world and that game engine. You could even have them all on VHS tapes with a story that you piece together as you play through the different rooms. The only problem would be coming up with a story reason for someone still owning an actual VHS cassette player. I don't know, one fell through a time portal maybe? We'll figure it out later. Super Mario Odyssey on the Switch is so effortlessly good at everything that it casually tosses out minigames so good that they could be a full game in their own right, and yet they feature once and never return. And also that terrible one where you have to walk in a line. <laughs> uh, Alright, it, keep the power moon. Our favourite minigame, however, has to be the Bound Bowl Grand Prix, which is found in the wintry Snow Kingdom. Entry into the Bound Bowl Grand Prix is gained by capturing one of the rotund locals, at which point you're given the option to take part in one of their traditional races. In these, the Shiverians roll into a ball and careen along an icy track, smashing into each other to jockey for position, as well as bounding, a technique whereby you jump as you hit the ground to provide an extra boost of speed. Though it seems cartoony and simple, Bound Bowl Grand Prix races are surprisingly technical, and the timing and positioning of your bounds is crucial if you're to keep your speed up through corners, and take the shortcuts you'll need to take in the later, harder races. <laughs> Bound Bowl Grand Prix is a fun and unique take on a racing game, and we would for sure play a full game based on rolling, bounding, and smashing our opponents off course. Plus, if we were playing as an actual Shiverian, we wouldn't have to worry about the fact that we possessed someone and were forcing them to race against their will. Your brain belongs to Mario now. Triad was the name of the card game that, as far as I could tell, everybody was obsessed with in the world of Final Fantasy VIII. It was like their Pokemon Go circa summer of 2016. 
In theory, you could play Final Fantasy VIII and barely encounter Triple Triad. I say in theory because my experience went as far the other way as it was possible to go, and may have involved saving and reloading games numerous times to improve the outcome of a partially randomised card game. Unless you're my mother watching this video, in which case I was definitely practising piano all that time and not doing that thing I just said. With Triple Triad being such a pleasing, relaxing pastime based on collectible cards with lovely artwork, it's really no surprise that every cool kid at Barlam Garden was playing it. Even when you consider the somewhat creepy factor that the faces of those cool kids appeared on the cards themselves. Which is kind of like me catching Andy in Pokemon Go. I tried it once, it didn't work. We all know what Mortal Kombat is about. It's about finding new and interesting ways to turn your opponent into what looks like the contents of a bin behind a butcher's shop. But what if instead of that, the competitors decided to set fighting aside and settle their differences on a go-kart track? Incredibly, that isn't the first line of Mike's Mortal Kombat fanfiction, it's the premise of the minigame Motor Kombat, which appeared in Mortal Kombat Armageddon and is exactly what it sounds like, which is a cartoony kart racer featuring stages and racers from Mortal Kombat. Motor Combat would make an excellent standalone game for several reasons. One, everyone loves kart racers. Two, each of the Mortal Kombat characters included has their own special ability with different effects. Scorpion, for example, can use his harpoon to pull himself ahead of enemies, and Sub Zero can freeze enemies solid with an ice ball. Finally, it's still pretty violent, letting you slam left and right to knock opponents off course, and with gory crashes and explosions if you stray too far from the racing line. Don't see that in Mario Kart. It's not the best kart racer ever made due to it being pretty much a joke inclusion in Mortal Kombat Armageddon, but given the extra time and attention that a standalone release would give it, I think Motor Kombat has the potential to be big in the world of kart racers. Just maybe not one for the kids, hey? Now I can show you a vast array of exciting things, from prize fights to carriage races. I think we can afford to spend a little time here. Television wasn't a practical technology until around the 1920s, which means that in Victorian times people had to do other things to entertain themselves, such as growing elaborate sideburns, jumping off roofs into piles of hay, and taking part in illegal underground fight clubs. Or at least that's the impression you get playing Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Luckily, the fight clubs are brilliant, letting you focus on Syndicate's weighty, satisfying combat as you batter a succession of dudes who look like extras from a Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes film. When hand-to-hand -hand combat is done well, it's a joy to play, and there's a lovely flow to the bare-knuckle boxing in Syndicate that would make for an excellent standalone 3D brawler. Add in unlockable moves and combos, special attacks and different characters, and you've got a winner on your hands. I'm still going to be Evie though, because she's a badass. Ready? Go. Super Monkey Ball on the Nintendo GameCube was a game in which you played as a bad monkey who had been sent to hell and as punishment was forced to navigate mazes in a clear plastic ball for the rest of eternity. At least I think that's what was going on. I always skip the intro cutscene. Pretty weird advert for Dole, whatever it was. Outside of the game proper, Super Monkey Ball also featured several mini-games, the best of which was Monkey Target. In Monkey Target, you had to launch your monkey off a ramp before opening your ball to form a makeshift pair of wings. You then had to glide towards a series of targets below where you'd score points based on where you landed. I definitely spent more time playing Monkey Target than the actual main game in Super Monkey Ball, and that's because it's fun, super addictive, and contains real elements of skill. 
You could close your ball to drop when you thought you were in the right spot, and there were usually several islands to aim for, with harder targets having higher point values, so you'd have to decide whether you wanted to play it safe or risk everything for a higher score. You also had to take into account things such as wind speed and direction, as well as obstacles that would be decided randomly before the round, such as clouds, bombs or deadly spiked balls hovering over the targets. Basically, Monkey Target was awesome, and even if we never get another fully-fledged Super Monkey Ball game, I want more Monkey Target in my life, and this is the only way it's going to happen. And believe me, the people at the Monkey Sanctuary are not receptive when you try to explain the concept to them. They call themselves animal lovers. Huh? Man, I was so into The World Ends With You when it came out on the Nintendo DS that the touchscreen on mine has never been the same. Like that. The World Ends With You was an action RPG about kids fighting monsters in an alternate reality that looks like the real world, but scarier. So like Stranger Things, but in Shibuya, Japan. And instead of a psychic little girl and D&D rulebooks, the youths of The World Ends With You had these cute pins, which were somehow magical weapons fashion statements and collectible toys all at the same time. If you're still looking for my Christmas present, I'll take some of those. I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Not only were these pins the basis for the combat system, and not only did they evolve with use into new and more powerful forms, and not only did they confer extra benefits if they were of a fashion brand that was on trend in your current district, but in your time off between battling supernatural baddies, you could ping them around a game board like they were supernatural pogs. <laughs> In the turn-based sideshow called Tin Pin Slammer, you took your pins and slid them around a board against an AI adversary or your actual friends trying to whack their pins off the board in an unexpectedly complex mini-game in which pins had stats governing weight, spin and resistance to being stunned, and also hammers. <laughs> Ping Ping Slammer was curiously addictive and perfect for a touchscreen, so sign me up for the iPhone equivalent app for trading and slamming pins right now. You win! Those are some of the mini games that we think deserve their own full standalone games. Here's a fun mini game for you that I think you'll enjoy. It's uh, clicking on one of these two videos here. Up here is uh, more videos from us. Down here is videos from Outside Extra. And you get one point for every video that you watch. Uh, the current high score is a million. So see if you can beat it. And also subscribe here on the subscribe board. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>